Hello, everyone. Today, Sam and I had a great conversation. A few topics that we detailed are how to perceive failure using trial and error, prioritizing your fundamentals, and resisting echo chambers. We speak on much more than this, but that is a few of the good topics we detailed. And if you enjoy this, please drop me a review or a rating on whatever platform you listen to podcast on. It is greatly appreciated and enjoy the conversation. The people that do the best are the people that don't do that. The people that show their real self and show the failures and show that they're not always perfect kind of thing, um, which I think is really cool because you obviously go over to well, like Instagram and stuff like that. And it's like you said, it's the people that are just flashing everything seem to be getting all the attention. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a, a real relevance when people are vulnerable. And that's part of why I'm here doing the podcast, because I want to share my experiences with people. Life, even when you're working to be better, working for a good purpose, it's still challenging. You still go through all these negative thoughts and you know it, I used to have bad days and now I have bad moments so that's something that's much better yeah and I think um I don't know about you but for me a big step in that was that realizing that other people go through that because I was obviously really into all these self-improvement books and you'd kind of read through it and almost re- think that the people talking were amazing all the time and they never mess up anymore and they've gone through it and it was only when I realized that no that's not true everyone goes through the exact same stuff as me that these bad moments or slip-ups started to become shorter and shorter Um, and yeah it became bad moments rather than bad months or weeks or whatever it was. And people get confused. I think the self-improvement books are wonderful. I, that's almost all I consume is, but it's not just pure self-improvement. It's the vulnerability that the improved people bring to the table. I, who are some of your favorite, um, I know we did mention a few of your podcasters you like, but what are some of your favorite self-improvement guys or people who really share their vulnerability with you? Um, I think, well, that James Altucher guy that I said about with the podcast um, was quite a big one because, yeah, he kind of lays it all out on the table and he obviously messed up or says he messed up twice with that losing all the money and um, not being there for his kids as much as he'd want to and kind of seeing that and seeing him bounce back uh, is really cool to be fair for me Um, and then there's people like um, like obviously James Clear and stuff like that with the kind of accident he he had earlier on um, with the baseball bat and stuff like that Um, and then seeing him kind of just go from writing online to then doing all this amazing stuff um, has been really cool but I think there's probably a ton of authors and people that I kind of have gathered things from that I'd completely forgotten about to be fair now. (laughs) Right. I'm not familiar with that baseball incident, but the premise of coming back from whatever you can call it hardship and challenges, but in the, the shifted mindset, they're actually opportunities because I almost all the people that I've spoken to that are on a journey to work for a better self, they're grateful for their past because the past is just full of lessons. And sure, in that moment, we definitely perceived it as self-pity. Why is this happening to me? Life is so hard. But then you get into your future, you have a bigger vision and you don't get value from winning all the time. I played football in high school and the losses always taught us much more than the wins. Oh yeah, massively. And it was, that's a big thing I've actually struggled with uh, throughout my life because in kind of school, college, university, I was always, I guess, luckily or thankfully able to uh, 
almost breeze through stuff without trying too hard. I was quite good at passing exams and memorizing stuff. And we're almost kind of conditioned to not make those mistakes because the people that make this mistake, no, the people that don't make the mistakes are the ones that get the good grades. Um, so I was really good in education. You could give me stuff and I'd get okay grades. And then I left university um, and I had this, all these aspirations to be a sound designer. Um, I was working towards that. And then I submitted my showreel to these people to kind of review it. And they said, they gave me all this feedback, which was actually really good feedback, but I took it like as a massive failure and it completely destroyed me. <laughs> and I, I literally gave up on that dream because of that, which is absolutely mental. And I had to sort of unlearn all the stuff that I'd learned at school or in the education system and learn that making mistakes and failing and all that kind of stuff was needed and it was fine and it's not a bad thing. Um, but it's actually been really hard for me to unlearn that because it was so ingrained into me not to make mistakes and not to fail and that it was bad to fail. Um, but yeah, I've, I'm, I mean, I'm still kind of working on it now, to be fair. It's, um, yeah, it's been a definite process, but the more I learn to fail, I've found the more I'm making progress and towards the things I want to do kind of thing. We're always that consistent work in progress. If, if we were perfect, it, it would kind of dimin diminish the value of every day. And there's this quote I like, something, it goes along the lines, if, if you, or criticism, criticism or commentary or feedback, it feels like a attack until you're ready to change. And it's very challenging to unlearn that idea that we're always meant to be right. I do a bit of work in the stock market and that taught me I need to get used to being incorrect because it's a game of probabilities. It's not an ego game. If you let your monkey brain, that's what a lot of the educators I've learned from have spoken about. If you allow that monkey brain to take over, it's that side of our brain, the ego that always wants to be right. And we have to figure out being incorrect. That is that shows we're working towards something. If you're always right, if you're always winning, you're, you're not in the state of flow because I think I've seen this from Dan Coe. The flow is, it's like you can't have too much anxiety and you can't have too much of a challenge. It's right in the middle of that anxiety and the challenge. And it's, it's funny how... I wanted life to be easy as a younger adolescent. And now I realize life's never going to be easy. You accept that and you do what you can with what you have. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's, it's the whole comfort thing as well. Um, I mean, I guess as humans, we try to seek out comfort and um, I guess in the past, like kind of caveman times, that was amazing. If you could seek comfort and you could, um, I don't know, find the, like the berries and the like the sweet things or whatever, you could gorge on those and you'd be set. Um, but then you'd have that adversity kind of inevitably. But then nowadays, because we've become so good at finding comfort, you could almost do it whenever you want. I could sit on the sofa and watch TV all day and gorge on sugar and fat or whatever. And actually that's not I mean, it makes you feel so much worse <laughs> in the long run um, than it does in the now kind of thing. But <laughs> it's that brings me to the idea of how our mind plays tricks on us. So the example I like is if you want to sleep in, sure, you feel good for maybe the 30 minutes to an hour when you're sleeping in. But if you sleep in all day, then you feel like shit. So where's the fine line? Or if you sleep in too much, you also have regret. And then your mind gets toxic and you kind of bully yourself. But in the beginning, your mind is telling you sleep in. So it's such an interesting thing to tussle with is how can we optimize our minds to feel good the most 
often amount of time. It's, there's no easy answer to it, but as you go, you kind of figure out, hey, this tool works for me, this works for me. I love going for nature walks, doing journaling, meditation. I, I never would have perceived that as helpful when I was younger. Oh yeah, I think I think that's it. You hit the nail on the head. It's kind of trying things and iterating and failing and and just getting to know the kind of things that work for you. And um, I mean it's kind of come to the point now like if I'm not feeling good in some kind of way I can I've like just got this list that I go down it's like have I drunk enough have I eaten enough have I I'm, I'm stressed about something have I slept enough like just working like the obvious things and it's always one of those that I can just like usually it tends to be water <laughs> if I drink a bit of water and it just instantly kind of lifts my mood or like exercise that kind of thing and yeah over time I've just found these little uh, mood boosters that I can use that just bring me out of a rut kind of thing and the same if I do go through a dip um, I always know how to kind of get back on track now and it's just through that constant failure and trying new things and iterating over time I guess. Right I feel we need to be reminded more often than learn new things it's these simple keys like hydration and overlooked aspects of taking care of your mood and noticing wait have i not eaten in the past few hours of course i'm going to begin to be cranky and irritable like people the, the mainstream media makes the world seem so complex that you need a lamborghini and you need a billion dollars to enjoy your life when in reality you take care of your fundamentals your nutrition you get good sleep you do dopamine detox where you're not artificially getting dopamine from porn or continuous social media or constant video games. Now, I think there's a place for video games. I played a lot of video games as a kid, but it's a fine line between being a natural human being and just diving off the deep end of that artificial world. I think that's it. Like, uh, back in the day like for example I was speaking to my granddad uh, yesterday and he was telling me about uh, they were the first ones on their street to buy a TV um, and they had one channel it was BBC and all the whole street would come around to their house and watch that TV they'd be uh, whatever it was like 15 20 people in their living room watching that TV which blew my mind and I said now we've got obviously these phones that can just lock us in for hours on end but he said this TV turned off at 10 p.m. Um, so that was the time you went to bed. And I think nowadays there's just so many ways to distract ourselves from uh, like our natural instincts, like am I hungry, am I thirsty, and stuff like exercise and uh, sleep and things like that. There's so many things now that can distract us from that, that it's very hard. And the same with advertisements, so many things saying, oh, buy this and you'll be happy or do this and you'll be happy or eat this don't eat that and it's just gets confusing but actually when you boil it down it's not as hard as you think <laughs> yeah and the, and the big monopolies the large corporations have completely taken advantage of a lack of education on the individual level for example <laughs> The things that they put in the grocery stores and how unique they are when they're advertising is just powerful. Like our government has these patents that the average Joe has no idea about. And it's kind of mind blowing when you think how deep our, our lives really are. They have patents on brainwashing. The television is called television because tell a vision there's programming there's channels and there's a lot of symbols that are just unique but back to the grocery store like 90 percent of the food in the store was non-existent 50 years ago or 100 years ago and that just says something in itself like we're eating food that was not on the planet 
in our history. And no wonder why, I don't know, you know, 40 to 50% of America is obese. It's unfortunate. And if more people recognize, okay, let's get back to the basics, eat. Of course, there's a balance. The the way that they produce chickens in factories, they're so slick with their advertising. There's like cage free and there's like free range. But then you look at a picture of what that really means and it's so corrupt. It's not cage free and it's not free range. They're, they're cramped in small areas. But my point is, we're supposed to eat animals. Animals are on this planet for a reason. And it, I'm not against vegans at all. Whatever works for you. But just personally, I feel my energy levels are, are raised when I'm eating whole natural foods with less ingredients and names that I can actually pronounce rather than crazy chemicals that I cannot even fathom how to say the name of it. Yeah, it's, there's a amazing so my favorite book on nutrition is um food rules by michael pollan and in the rules are, so the premise of the book on the front it says eat food mostly plants not too much and the rules are things like don't eat anything that your great grandma wouldn't recognize and don't eat anything that has ingredients in it that you wouldn't just keep in your cupboard. So like the chemical things that you were saying and it follows on and it's just a load of straightforward rules like that. It's only a kind of small book, um, but it just makes it so simple. It's like, oh yeah, that's completely obvious. Like just don't eat the crap processed, but <laughs> yeah, it's even, even like, the vegetables nowadays some of them it's like do you trust that they're from natural places or it's, it's a lot harder than just like picking the vegetables or picking the meat for example because like you said sometimes they're well often packed with crap anyway and antibiotics or whatever else so it's definitely become a lot harder than back in the day yeah and it's i guess with the abundance of information it's our jobs to be the the ones who really seek the correct information like we have so much coming at us nowadays we really have to be good at filtering what we consume and that leads us back to the the social media feeds if you cultivate your feed to be healthy information you're going to learn and benefit from it sure there's still some pitfalls you got to be careful with the artificial dopamine getting likes and followers and constantly checking for that but in in the big picture it's like we are responsible for what we consume your input directly correlates to your output yeah definitely and I, I think that I guess leads back into the kind of trying and iterating and stuff because there's so much conflict in information online as well that say for example the vegan and the plant-based whatever and meat eating you can I could search anything about diet on the internet and I could get 10 links that confirm what I've just thought so and I used to get really bogged down with that because I've gone through the vegan stage, I've gone through the vegetarian, I've gone through all these different ways of eating. And I was getting so confused as to what I should be doing. But actually now I just kind of go with what I feel like. I, like, I, And it's, that's basically landed on me mostly eating vegetarian, but I do have like, I will have meat um, every so often, like I have many times a week. Um, and that's what works for me and I don't I've kind of just found that through that trying different things and iterating and realizing what works for me and I think that's the best for everything I mean just consume a ton of stuff with a, all these different opinions don't be fixated on your one opinion and just try everything see what works for you and don't stress about it too much like we've got we've got a long old time here you can <laughs> try as much as you want that really I don't like the word perfect but the trial and error aspect of experience is the right way to go about it because that that's what bothers me about the idea of cancel culture or how we're limiting the freedom of speech so much let's allow people to have debates and another thing that bothers me is the whole leftism idea of 
completely attacking your the side you don't agree with. Like, I am not a super big fan of being a vegetarian because that's not something that's worked for me. But do I completely respect vegetarians? Yes. It's like the trial and error. Allow people to figure out what works for them. And then as long as no one's forcing something upon you, it's not your business to be offended just because someone isn't doing the same thing as you. And I, I really am working to not only make myself more understanding and more open to all opinions and all views, but I, it, it has to be one of the most important things for the humanity or the world. If you're so closed off and you can't even consider someone else, someone else's opinion, then you're completely limiting your potential to learn and grow and to become someone who is better. Yeah, I, th I think the so over the last like I don't know maybe two years or so I've kind of got into the thing of not pushing my opinion or not like arguing my opinion on anything because I've sort of come to realize that I'm wrong about pretty much everything. <laughs> There's like just because I think it's right doesn't mean it is right kind of thing, and I've sort of I try and like say I've got an opinion on something, say the vegan thing, I will always try and look at the complete opposite opinion and I'll make sure I do, um, I'm not in this like echo chamber of like these are my views and I'm not going to go outside of them because I think people are quick to just like completely disregard, like take politics, I don't really what, like talking about politics, but take politics for example, if I say I'm left, like a lot of people just don't even like entertain some kind of viewpoint from someone on the right just because they say that they're on the right but in actual fact everyone wants the same stuff <laughs> literally everyone's fighting for the same stuff it's just like different ways of getting there and there's actually if you opened your mind to these different opinions you'd realize that um that there's a lot more like crossover than you think and there's a lot more common ground um yeah, I, do, I definitely agree that it's a flawed part of society, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the politics aspect of our current society is so aggravating to me because it's nothing but division. When I go into the gym, I turn off the TVs and I take pride in that because my people, my environment does not need constant division shoved down their throats. And it, it's our job to recognize you're human, I'm human, we're all human, and we need the simple basics. We need water, we need kindness, human connection to exercise, the proper nutrition. There's just an abundant list of things that all of humanity needs, but rather the mainstream will just focus on anything and everything to get people irrational and polarized to the point where you're this and I'm that and we have nothing in common. Are you really so sure that we have nothing in common the just I urge people to inquire deeper into themselves and ask the questions who do I want to become who do I admire and kind of get clear on your big picture vision do you want to be someone who is living in that echo chamber as you mentioned so closed off to anyone and everyone else's views or do you consider others? And sure, someone's opinion is the opinion. It's not a fact, but you could still at least listen to it and ponder on their opinion a little bit. And be friendly with them. That's the other thing. People like, as soon as someone has a different opinion to you, it's like, oh, I can't associate with you. It's like, what the hell? Like, you, <laughs> you want to surely associate with people of different backgrounds so you can widen your own thinking don't just I don't know everyone just likes to be validated I think like they like people to yes men to say oh yeah like the way you think is correct or whatever it is but I don't know I want I kind of want to be challenged on the way I'm thinking and be yeah questioned about my views and stuff
I've heard a lot of people, successful people, just dissipate the idea of having yes men around. That does nothing for our progression. We need people who are going to challenge our views and to check us every once in a while. It's, there's a balance in life. We need the people who are going to be consistently there all the time. We need the people who check us when we're getting cocky or arrogant. We need someone who loves us unconditionally. There's just, it, we're all humans and it's, it's easy to overlook the common aspects that we all need to feel good and to be in a, a good mood where we can actually uplift others and be a positive influence rather than a complainer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's the same like on Twitter and stuff like that. I love it when I get someone commenting and like challenging what I've kind of said and saying, oh, have you thought, I thought about it in this way or like, um, that's not quite true. And um, there's been times where I've put something up and someone said something and I've said, oh crap, yeah, you're like completely right. So what I just said is complete bullshit basically. Um, and I like that because I, I don't know, I, I want to like grow as a person, I guess. There's this idea and complete, it's completely true. There's much more that we don't know compared to what we know. And if you embody that, you can do what you did with that person in the comment section. It's awesome to have people react to you where they are not agreeing to you, but they're also not being rude. Like it's so important to me to be kind, no matter what the situation, just because you're not completely in the, the same idea as someone else, hear them out and correct or not correct them, but give them your idea, your opinion in a friendly manner and then see what you guys can learn. Who knows, you might become friends. Yeah, well, that's, that's I think, part of the problem with uh, kind of veganism and stuff like that is uh, if obviously you got all the, I guess, vegans that, that kind of push that as the way that you should be, but rather than kind of try, just trying to, educate people in a friendly manner not even educate that's probably the wrong word just like like i don't know talk to people about it it seems like it's just like a barrage of like you need to like stop eating all this now and it just pushes people away but the way or when i was eating less meat and less dairy and stuff like that the way i went about it was saying rather than just being black and white, you're either vegan or you're not, you should be like, maybe every Monday you don't eat dairy and meat, and that will do a ton of good for the environment, and it's way more sustainable for someone to do, and you explain why that's a good thing, you don't say, like, berate people for their choices, because that's just going to make them want to do it more, <laughs> it's, yeah, crazy. It, the idea that we shouldn't really give advice to someone who hasn't asked us for advice. If you want to share your opinions and views in a deep conversation, that's awesome. See what you can learn from each other. But it, too often, people just say, I'm right. This is a fact. And then you're closed off to the other side, which gets no one anywhere. Rather, I'm a huge fan of sustainable farming, and I'm very big on humane treatment of animals. I cannot stand anything like factory farming or the ideas that are not sustainable. And then you can learn from other people who are not because we all have different experiences. I love this, this thought. Each of us is one of one. There will never be another Sam. There will never be another Justin. We are completely unique in our own ways. No one has lived the exact same life as us. So be open, be friendly, and share what you've learned. And amazing things will come from that. Mm, yeah, 100%. I, I mean, it's... Uh, I mean, yeah, I completely agree with everything. <laughs> yes, but I, I guess, uh, like, the question would be, how do we get to that stage? I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I, I don't know how we get to that because I, I don't know. The world at the moment just seems, like you said, so polar, uh, polarized. Like it's either like black or white, 
and I don't know I don't know how we how we get to a stage where people are more open to um kind of sharing opinions and there's not this like cancel culture and stuff like that I don't know I I think it starts on an individual level but I have a question for you that will relate into that and it's simple what's your foundation to a good day um I think my it's so cliche to say but my mornings are the one thing that kind of set the scene for my kind of good day um because I find when those that kind of drops off everything else seems to like follow it it's almost like it sets me up for that bad day if I um so if I contrast two days like a good day uh kind of my alarm goes off at half five if I like jump out of bed have a glass of water go downstairs and start working and then exercise do this stuff it sets me up for that day and then in contrast to that if say my alarm goes off and I press snooze and sleep in and then I wake up and I've got low energy because I've snoozed 10 times or whatever and then that has a knock-on effect so then the next thing I like forget to drink the water and then I haven't got time to do the work which then stresses me out and this that and the other so I think um yeah like I said as cliche as it is it's that first hour in the day if I can get that right then it's just like compounding throughout the day just everything else follows on from that but then if that first hour is not spent well then it just kind of goes down that for me anyway I don't think you're alone with that I really 100 percent it's not solely the morning it kind of starts this is cliche too i think a lot of what has made me a better person is cliche bullshit but it it completely works so is it even uh, does it deserve to be deemed cliche if it works i don't know but it, it starts the night before if you don't eat two to three hours before bed that's important because you eat before bed, it lowers your ability to get a full deep sleep. So you get a good seven to eight hours, literally 99% of humans need seven to eight hours of sleep. I've talked to people who think they're that outlier. And I'm like, okay, buddy, maybe you are, but are you really so sure? (laughs) And then it, it goes right into the morning. And we are humans we our brain operates i think 80 percent of the time off habits it's not even thinking it's that's a weird way to phrase it the brain's thinking but it is a habit machine and that drives the importance of having routines and routines that you enjoy it kind of took me time to figure out how to enjoy these mundane tasks like reading and journaling and meditating. But once you do healthy activities consistently, you realize, (laughs) wow, this makes me feel good. So I better enjoy it. Don't you want to feel good? It's kind of odd how most people will go work Monday through Friday and then drink their weekends away but that doesn't make you feel good in the long term. It gives you amazing instant gratification. But that's another idea we can ponder on is the difference of learning to enjoy delaying gratification because it's not easy to do. But when you have a bigger picture vision, it's 100% necessary if you want that good future to come true. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's the biggest thing I'm kind of working on at the moment is like loving the process and kind of loving that delayed gratification because I'm obviously like way ahead of what I was before, but it's what I think is one of the main things if you want to kind of get anywhere or do the things you want is, yeah, loving that delayed gratification. And like you said, it's loving what you're doing because for example I have tried to wake up early for like as long as I can or ever since I've been into like self-improvement stuff I've been like yeah I need to wake up at like 5am and do all this stuff and I'd always I might do it for like a day or two and it would just never come to pass and the only time I've I'd managed to do it 
was when I started writing in the morning because then I was super excited to kind of get up and do that so then I was able to then jump out of bed at 5 30 because I was excited to go and write um so yeah it was like finding I guess that purpose or whatever like why um yeah really helped me to kind of do that and then like you said as well once you start seeing results from that and once I started seeing like oh if I wake up at 5 30 I've got an hour or an hour and a half before anyone else wakes up to do whatever I want that was it then like I was like this is amazing <laughs> and it makes it so much easier and once you build that build that momentum it's like yeah amazing and I still fall off now but like, I've kind of had a little bit of time like what a couple of weeks ago a week ago where I kind of dropped off and I was being a bit bad with waking up early but I've got back into it now and it's going well <laughs> Yeah, it, we're not perfect. It's completely okay. You don't want to be, a, I struggle with this often, is being too hard on myself. And it's taken a long time to correct that route. But it, it's worth doing because you're your biggest critic. And that's almost always a fact. Sometimes there's, there's worse bullies, but for the most part, once we get into adulthood, we are the, our worst enemy. And so I like your point of having something that you enjoy that brings you energy at the beginning of your day. For me, that's the gym and it's hard. The gym's hard, but it makes me feel good. So what do you write about specifically? And I, I think writing is so beautiful because it allows us to connect the dots. Like in our head, we have a bunch of thoughts, but once you start writing about them, they become just clearer and more organized. Yeah, I massively underestimated writing. Uh, I mean, I so I started writing, well, I'd kind of always tried to like start a blog and all that kind of thing but it was solely focused on like oh I want to make money from this blog <laughs> like that was that was why I was doing it and so um, obviously it would um kind of fall off and it, it's quite funny there was one I started that was based around not finishing what I started and I wrote one post on it and then didn't <laughs> ever again um but I've lost my train of thought now uh, it, it's it's but yeah yeah sorry yeah the writing <laughs> that was it um yeah so i started these blogs and then it was only the start of the pandemic i started a newsletter that was sort of helping people improve their mental health uh, throughout the pandemic because i saw people um like really struggling and yeah i was writing this weekly newsletter and it almost became writing for me um and i was like writing this newsletter I guess four other people but it was writing it for myself um, um but it was a weekly thing i was only once a week i was writing and then i joined ship 30 uh which obviously that's like daily writing and it, from then it just went poof, like and all my like threads and tweets and whatever else i write it's all just for myself like you you look through my like twitter and it may be like personal stuff or platitudes or whatever it is and it's all just for me is reminding myself of all these things and <laughs> um it also makes it easy to write it i guess because i know exactly what i need to hear and <laughs> or what i needed to hear six months ago or a year ago it's beautiful how when <laughs> when your purpose was to make money <laughs> it just doesn't turn out good but when your purpose is to serve others you end up serving yourself in the service of others because the act of writing like you said and like i spoke on earlier we almost always know what needs to be done but we're not reminding ourselves what needs to be done so writing is that act in which we remind ourselves while providing information or guidance or potential building of new relationships with new people. And at the same time, we're helping ourselves, reminding what is important to remain happy and feel good. And it's an interesting topic because you wouldn't come to this conclusion until you put yourself through 
having the sole purpose to provide for others. When we're chasing money, it, it's never, <laughs> it, it's hilarious how it works, really, because every person I've spoken to who did something to chase money, it ended up not working. You, you lose inspiration. There's no real passion in it. And it's just for that external good. But when you're serving others, it's it's beautiful. You serve yourself and you, you meet new people. It's like it compounding both ways. Yeah, well, that's it. And I mean, the amount of kind of things I've tried in the past uh, just to make money and they I might stick with them for a few months, uh, not even that, like absolute maximum. And then, yeah, with this, I mean, I've been writing on Twitter for like, I don't know, seven or eight months now and I've made um kind of barely anything from it but I just I know I'm going to stick with it for the long haul even if I don't make money just because I absolutely love it like I would it's just like a hobby for me now like it's just so fun and I think it's become that accountability for me um like in the last or since I've been writing on Twitter I haven't fallen off the wagon like I would have done like half as much because I'm almost I, I feel like I'm teaching this stuff so I've then got to live it um so yeah like if I do fall off the wagon it will be for like a couple of days maybe and then I'm back on kind of thing and yeah and it's just that yeah accountability I guess from thinking that I or feeling that I have to live what I'm writing about I I feel the same way if you're aim is to teach people to share what has helped you it holds you to a higher standard because only a clown is going to speak on things or write about things that they're not living themselves and it's not that it's easy for us to hold the high standard but it's so much easier to hold that standard when it isn't only for us and i I was a very self-centered person because that's how society programmed and conditioned me throughout high school. I want the girl, the money, the cars, only that for me. And now I've grown up a bit and come to the realization, oh, wow, I feel much better when I'm trying to teach people what has made me a happier, healthier, more confident human. And at the same time, I'm holding myself accountable because if I speak on those things and I don't do it, oh man, my mind would tear me apart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you feel like a well, I'd feel like a fraud if I was saying, yeah, like exercise and do this, do that, like write or whatever it is. And if I wasn't doing that myself, I, I don't know, I just wouldn't feel right at all. <laughs> <laughs> feeling like a fraud i don't think there's any worse feeling than that let me here's another good question so i think i know a bit about what drives you but this is just a broader question what do you view as your big picture purpose um it's uh, I, i'm rolling out all the cliche stuff today <laughs> 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 but it is that kind of um I don't know if this is, I'm obviously still, I guess, working out what drives me, I guess, still finding that. But at the moment, it is just helping people. Like every time I get a message saying that, like, oh, thank you for this tweet or Fred, or um, like I've implemented this and it's worked and uh, or asking me questions and then saying, oh, thanks for that. It just gives me so much like energy and I just feel absolutely incredible about it. And um, I don't know, I just want to, I guess, help as many people live the life that they want to live because I feel like society in general doesn't gear towards that, like 99% of the time you're told to buy more stuff and um, stay in your comfort zone, whatever else, all this stuff, and I guess I just want to share the stuff that's helped me. Um, because, I don't know, it feels good. <laughs> I think that's the root of many humans, many successful, rich, wealthy humans' purpose comes from just that. It's 
the, the society is like this for a reason. It's not by accident that our society drives, okay, pharmaceuticals. You, you get a pill, spend this money, and you're cured. No, it cures a symptom, not the root cause. What we're aiming to do is get at the root causes of people's unfulfillment or unhappiness. And that comes from hard things. This is another thing that society implements. They, they send you this get rich quick idea or this quick, easy solution theory. When in reality, people like me and you are honest and share the fact that it's not going to be easy. This will be something that challenges you like we spoke on earlier every day is still going to be hard and once you accept that okay now you can make the best out of it but i just oh society triggers me because they never urge you to embrace difficulty and view it as an opportunity and we're beings i like this idea see i wear a cross but i'm not a big modern religion person because i understand we are spiritual beings in a human body and we're beings of energy by having this conversation and having a deep intellectual uh arranged not arrangement but we're tossing around ideas we're sharing experiences this is what raises people's energy not what what the normal society wants you to do is scroll away and go work your nine to five work the nine to five and don't collaborate with people like the whole covid thing triggered me because they're telling you not to visit your family not to have conversations to cover up our smiles the mask thing pissed me off because we have smiles for a reason when you smile it's scientifically proven to raise your mood even if you're not happy and there's just so much that is obvious to me but then a lot of people don't see through it maybe i'm just more of a a skeptical person in general, but I just realized what works for me is real human connection, less phone, more deep conversations, less scrolling, and more in-depth work rather than artificial stimulants. And that's a bit of a rant, but there's just there's just a lot to talk about. I, I think it um of something that I kind of ponder over a lot is how to live like as close to our sort of caveman like biological kind of times with our like modern comforts if you see what I'm saying so like um like with that community side of things and like you would sit around the campfire or whatever and um tell stories every night and you'd um eat when you were hungry or like through instinct and you would um like have those adversities and you would um go out like moving almost all day every day and it's i think a lot of unhappiness is coming from almost going against all of our natural kind of instincts and the things that we've almost like evolved to do over thousands of years and i think um there's obviously human instincts that don't serve us at the moment, as in like um, uh, like sugar and fat craving and stuff, it's stuff like that you need to kind of limit. But the fundamental kind of move a lot and like doing stuff uh, from your gut, like uh, what kind of food do I need to eat? I think that's the key to a happy life almost, is just living in accordance with that kind of stuff. The evolutionary view is something I resonate well with, too. Getting sunlight early in your day, that's going to make you sleep better. I like getting my bare feet on grass. It's scientifically proven to lower inflammation, but it also brings you a feeling of bliss. And then just 
what looking at the trees under looking at flowers and butterflies and animals like as a, a masculine man and i'm also a student of philosophy there's a feminine side of the man as well and we have to get in touch with the nature and the beauty of the environment but back to those roots that really is the key we have so much comfort that it becomes a crutch and when you sit in a comfort zone indulging in whether whether it's sugar porn indulging into anything it it fries your natural ability to be happy and i like this idea you can't be stressed and appreciative at the same time so what you touched on is the importance of balancing our our luxuries that we have with the environment or with the in environmental what's evolutionary that's the word that balancing our comfort zone with our evolutionary biases i don't like that word but still it, we have so much at our hands and so much luxury that if you're not very conscious about what you're consuming and how you're spending your time, you become frail and weak. And then you just find yourself unhappy and playing the victim card. Yeah. Well, it's like the um, one of the stoic virtues, like temperance, it's just that having that moderation and that balance, like understanding what these human instincts are that we are kind of um are almost like biological kind of instincts what they are and um i guess limiting them so like you said with the porn like that's obviously because we're geared to want to reproduce and all that so it's obviously going to fire these crazy signals in our mind and with like gossiping and that like back in like however long ago 10 000 20 000 years ago gossiping would have been incredibly beneficial to you if someone came to you and said oh like jerry betrayed peter i'm sure they didn't have those names but <laughs> um Arganog, maybe um <laughs> but yeah if, if someone, came, someone came to you and said that yeah they betrayed them that was amazing information to you because then you can avoid so and so and not get betrayed that by them and survive and then fast forward to nowadays when we've got say facebook and you're just scrolling through like celebrity gossip that doesn't serve you at all and but there's like so many things like this the whole way down the line like that just no longer serve us at all like uh i, was, I had a few more in my head then but i can't think but yeah all these things that like no longer serve us like the fear that was it fear of rejection and failure and embarrassment like back twenty thousand years ago if you got rejected by these 30 people in your tribe you were fucked <laughs> sorry i don't know if i'm gonna be swear but um yeah like you would die basically if you didn't have those but now if you're rejected by like if you rejected me i've got like however many billion people that i could like kind of find like with the internet it's almost immeasurable and it's yeah these ingrained fears if you can kind of get over those then you're flying basically yeah and a way to kind of sum this up is we're either using the mind as a tool or we get trapped in the prison of our minds and another thing is our amygdala back in the evolutionary days we need to sense or have fear if the brush is moving maybe there's a lion about to come at us but now <clears throat> there's a scientific statistic 80 85 percent of our fears never come true but we still have them so by understanding these things there it's a way to use your brain it and the same thing with social media we have so many tools at our hands but and it goes with the things you own as well do the things you own own you or do you own them like if you get a super big car payment and you're constantly stressing about that car payment it owns you you don't own the bmw and it, it's very intriguing how 
you, you study philosophy and you, you work on your mindset, how things of the past, maybe not too much has changed. Like what, three, four years ago, I still had a house. I still had water, still had almost everything I have now, but my days are much more enjoyable now because I've learned and adapted in the usage of my mind rather than being controlled by it yeah and I, I think it's like such a good rabbit hole to go down like uh um a lot of people kind of fear old age and fear getting older but i'm of the like complete opposite end of the spectrum because i know how far i've come in the last say five years just working on like my mind and like my body and all that kind of thing and i'm just excited to see how i feel 10 years from now um and it's like I, I, I can't remember where I read it now I read something the other day and it was um saying think of yourself kind of 10 years ago your beliefs and your fears and worries and what you had and compare that to now and it's probably like worlds and worlds apart and then now compare that to say 10 years from now just think how much you're going to change and that's what excites me I think I'm looking forward to growing older and wiser <laughs> see that's beautiful when you can recognize the small wins the progression you've made from your previous self i think there's a place for comparing yourself to others but very sparingly must this be used because if you're just looking at whoever the the nfl athlete anyone on social media it's so easy to cycle those negative thoughts through your head but if you compare yourself to you a couple years ago, even half a year ago, there's so much progress that you've made. Even if you weren't purposely working on yourself, you, you come to that realization, okay, if I wasn't even focusing on bettering myself, imagine what I could do if I get intentional with my time and create a routine that allows me to pursue what I want to get better at. And there's just so many tools and methods that we can use to enjoy life more. That idea of we're not going to be here forever. I was just journaling on this today. And it, it brings you because I had a feeling of numbness of not feeling too good yesterday. I watched a video that reminded me of our eventual death. And there's nothing to be scared of more. So we have to just embrace our potential and not waste the days. I just wrote in this new journal today, the amount of days until I'm 90 years old. It's something like 24,000 days. Like, sure, that seems like a lot, but is it really that much? I don't know. We, the point is, we have to value every moment. And if you don't remind yourself of your eventual death, then life can get stale and you can become stagnant and fall into a comfort zone of self pity and misery. On the other hand, you embrace the fact that you won't be here forever. You, you enjoy your progression. You're proud of the small wins you're making. That makes a big difference in your self-image and how you live every single day. Yeah, I mean, thinking about my kind of own death is like, I, I, it sounds really weird to say, but it's like I love doing it and I've got a memento more coin in my wallet is like uh, remember you could die or leave life right now let that determine what you do and say and think and I just think realizing that life is kind of impermanent is the most powerful thing that you could ever do because if you it like it just boosts everything like your relationships if you think oh I might not see this person again as morbid as that sounds you will cherish that moment and the same if i think today like oh this may be my last day like you're going to completely absorb your surrounding you're going to try and make the best of this day and this i always like a scenario i like to think of is like i'm on my deathbed and i like I can, you can hear the heart monitor beeping you're like thinking back on your life and 
am I looking back at my life saying, yeah, I gave that a good shot. I did everything I want to. Um, like I've lived the life I want to live. Or am I thinking back on my life thinking, oh, I wish I could go back to my age. I wish I could go back to 27 years old and do that differently or have that opportunity again. And that's another thing that drives me really, I guess, is just wanting to just completely live the life I want to lead, basically. Not even the life I want to lead, but strive to like work towards it, I guess. Well, as humans, we have this ability to foresee regret and that completely goes into this idea of viewing the, the potential end as occurring any day. If we can foresee regret and understand, I want to, maybe not legacy, but you want to live a certain way. You want to be remembered as a certain person. Like for me, kindness and generosity, considering everyone as equal and recognizing that all humans deserve love and respect and at least uh, an openness to consider their views. That's what I want to be remembered as. So it's a continuous reminder each day. How, how do I want to carry myself? Do I want to lead by example? Yes. And to make an influence, to be someone that I view as valuable or I look up to the philosophers a lot and the way that they live their lives is just pure application of wisdom. They, they embodied what they knew. And if you, you're honest with yourself, that's a, a key point to this. A lot of people aren't honest with themselves about what they want. And it's not easy to know exactly what you want, but at least get clear on your values. That's a good place to start. What's important to you? And then from there, you can take steps. And this goes into the importance of journaling. If I didn't journal, I wouldn't be able to clarify these ideas to you because they would just be unconnected dots in my head. Yeah, I just, yeah, I, th I think kind of as well, we're just so like lucky to be here I think we kind of just owe it to the people that couldn't didn't make it far or like whatever because if you think about what is it the chance of you know, like your single sperm reaching the egg is what one in like a billion or a trillion but then if you think about that that's like crazy but then also there's that chance that that exact sperm for your parents met like same two parents and then like the exact sperm that one billion one trillion chance their parents and that goes back like hundreds of generations like the like likelihood of us being here talking in this conversation is like just ridiculous when you think about it and so we're just like you need to make the most of that luck really and like i don't know just not waste it by living to your values like you were saying and all this stuff but it, yeah it it blows my mind when I think about this stuff this whole thing is quite ridiculous the existence uh, we'll leave off with this idea be sure that you are living a life rather than simply existing and Geez, there's so much to think about, but I this conversation was great. If you want to send the listeners anywhere, where should we send them? Uh, I guess the best place would be my Twitter, which is at I am Sam underscore Williams. And that's where I live basically online. <laughs> um, but yeah, it'd be awesome to connect with people. I absolutely love it. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful to have a great in-depth conversation. Every single time I speak with people, I leave and my mood is just boosted through the roof. There's nothing better than just having real raw connection with another human. Yeah, thank you so much. For <laughs> and likewise, I absolutely love it. And this has been so fun. 